Love it or hate it, Druid has had many ups and downs in its history. It has also been incredibly diverse, with everything from ramp, combo, token, and aggro being at the top of the meta at some point. Everyone's played a Druid deck and I'm sure everyone's been upset to play against one. So let's take a look at how nature can rise against you and how it can fall. After the launch of the game, thanks to its ramp tools, Druid developed as the premier big minion deck. Famously introducing the Innervate plus Chillwind Yeti combo that is still talked about today, the Ramp Druid deck was one of the strongest during the time, second only to the never disappearing Miracle Rogue and the innovative Backspace Rogue. Thais and Strife Crow eventually modified the first variations of Ramp Druid to include Force of Nature and Savage Roar, turning it into a mid-range deck. Once Naxxramas was introduced, Druid gained tools like Shade of Naxxramas and Loatheb to apply even more mid-range pressure. In November of 2014, the first Hearthstone World Championship took place. The full power of Force of Nature and Savage Roar was seen by all, as Firebat took the title of champion. From this point on, 14 health would be a scary spot to be in against a Druid. However, Druid, like the animal that it is, went into hibernation once Goblins vs. Gnomes released in December of that year, as aggro decks and handlock were running rampant and Druid lacked the tools to compete. Druid would only begin to re-emerge with the release of Blackrock Mountain, which provided Emperor Tharrison. While the inclusion gave it a significant damage increase, this was the era of Patron Warrior and Oil Rogue, so Druid never got any higher than Tier 2. After the nerfs in October to Warsong Commander, Druid finally managed to climb to the top of the meta. The other Tier 1 decks at the time were all similar in power level, and one was not stronger than the other. Even after League of Explorers settled, Druid was still a powerful pick. So much so that even though there were other problematic decks, the combo of Force of Nature and Savage Roar was hated more. In a way, the roar was heard, and Team 5 listened. Alongside the announcement of the Year of the Kraken, many cards were nerfed, notably including Force of Nature and Ancient of Lore. The reaction was that this was the final blow to Druid, as Force and Savage was the key combo. This ended up being only somewhat true, as Whispers of the Old Gods brought the class the Cthulhu Druid and Yogg Druid archetypes, but both only ended up being mid-tier 2. However, Yogg Druid was still being tinkered with, and it was eventually tuned to the point where it finally crept into Tier 1. No surprises here, during that time Yogg enabled many decks, as that was the strength of the card. Once One Night in Karazhan hit, Yogg Druid became even better with the addition of Arcane Giant and Moonglade Portal. To complement the new additions, the deck added Malagos and Moonfire as a finisher. All in all, the deck had tempo, finishers, and ways to come back from losing. On first glance, it could look like something that was thrown together randomly, but it was actually very consistent at what it did. No small thanks to how the Year of the Kraken slowed down the meta, enabling cycle decks to overperform. Beast Synergies, a previously hunter-specific mechanic, was something else that was brought to Druid with the release of Karazhan. Menagerie Warden and the Curator gave Druid a different angle to explore and brought us the first Beast Druid deck. Even though it only remained at Tier 2, it was still important, because a few months later, in October of 2016, Yogg-Saron would get its nerf to no longer cast spells when it was silenced or killed. This ended the reign of Yogg Druid. During December of that year, Mean Streets of Gadgetsan hit, and with it, the infamous powerful Jade mechanic for Druid, Rogue, and Shaman. While Shaman was the breakout class for Jade, Druid got Jade Idol. Primarily built around this card, the deck was the control that never fatigued. Unfortunately, during this time, the meta was oppressed by Kazakus and Patches, so Jade Druid never got any higher than the bottom of Tier 2. Gadgetsan also gave us Kun, the Forgotten King. This brought the broken interaction where Aviana into Kun resulted in access to 10 mana with all of your minions costing 1, enabling crazy combos like Alexstrasza into Malagos, into 2 Swipes, into 2 Living Roots, and then into 2 Moonfires. This deck was the new and improved ramp druid that hadn't been around for some time, but unfortunately still overshadowed by Kazakus and Patch's decks. After small-time Buccaneer and Spirit Claw nerfs, more mid-range archetypes like Mid Shaman and Dragon Priest began to pop up, allowing Jade Druid to slowly climb. Jade Druid just barely made it into Tier 1 in March before the Ungoro release. The release of Journey to Ungoro shook up the meta so hard that Jade Druid fell to nothingness. But from its ashes, a new type of Druid deck never seen before rose. Aggro Druid, a weird mix of beasts, murlocs, and pirates. An incredibly unique deck, Aggro Druid began in Tier 2, but it was still missing something crucial. Vicious Fledgling was the final piece of that puzzle. It took players around 3 weeks to understand how broken Vicious Fledgling, or as it was lovingly called, Flappy Bird was. Innervate plus Fledgling on its own could close out games. Notorious for many turn 1 concedes, Aggro Druid was now finally Tier 1. More anti-aggro and counter tools were added, replacing Murlocs, the weaker portion of the deck. The deck was further tuned with Tark Reaper to deal with other aggressive decks and Bitterhide Hydra to tempo against decks that lacked single target removal. To combat the prevalence of Murloc Paladin, it added the never-before-used Hungry Crab. A painful craft for some, but that was the price to play Druid. 
Knights of the Frozen Throne released in August of 2017, releasing three of the strongest druid cards to ever exist in the game. Malfurion the Pestilent, Spreading Plague, and Ultimate Infestation. The other druid cards in the set were also quite powerful, and ended up impacting the game later on. Druid no longer needed card draw like Gadgets and Auctioneer. Now all it needed was to play Ramp like Wild Growth and Nourish to play Ultimate Infestation as soon as possible. If any deck tried to combat the Ramp cards with aggro strategies, Druid could simply throw down a Spreading Plague. For the first time ever, an entire class was S-Tier. Decks like Undertaker, Hunter, and Patron Warrior filled this role before, but they were just the best decks of their class. Jade Druid, Aggro Druid, Token Druid, and Ramp Druid were at the top of their game, and seemingly nothing could compete. No King reigns forever though. While Jade Druid and Aggro Druid remained at the top, the other Druid decks fell down to Tier 1, which now consisted of Raza Priest, Murloc Paladin, and Pyre Warrior. The meta was dismissive of Tier 1 though. If you were anybody that cared about their win rate, you had two kinds of decks you could play. Druid, Jade, or Aggro. This oppressive regime prompted nerfs to the class. Innervate now provided only one mana and Spreading Plague had its cost increased to 6. This was enough to slow down Druid. Jade Druid was now Tier 1 and its aggro brother fell to Tier 2. Despite the nerfs, Jade Druid was still very powerful, and combined with Raza Priest, the other Tier 1 deck, aggro was shut out. This led to the rise of Big Druid, something that could compete with Jade and Raza Priest. Jade Druid was consistent at mana ramping, but it still took a while for the actual Jade minions to ramp up to a sizable threat. Big Druid ramped at around the same rate, but was able to throw down 8-8 worth of stats on curve. With Medivh and Kun, it also had the ability to bring out multiple big minions on the same turn. Big Druid's onslaught of big minions kept Jade Druid in check until the next expansion. The next expansion, Kobolds and Catacombs, put Druid in the backseat for a while. The ridiculous combo and pressure that Raza Priest and Q-Block, the new tier S, put on the other decks couldn't be matched. Usually Druid has the time to ramp to play its powerful cards, but when Q-Block plays Skull of the Minari or Possessed Lackey on 5, that plan goes out the door. In February of 2018, Raza Priest finally received its nerfs. J Druid was back on the menu, but the dominance of Q-Block and Control Warlock led to the popularity of Spiteful Summoner decks. Druid was able to utilize Spiteful well, because its enabler was Ultimate Infestation, much better than Priest's Mind Control late in the game. The deck was still outshone by Priest, as cards like Draconid Operative and Cabal Talent Priest were still in the format. But when Witchwood released in April, Priest lost its Dragon Package, and now Spiteful Druid was the deck of choice. In the Witchwood era, the 10-mana minion pool didn't really have any bad choices. The worst you could get was a Sea Giant, with the top end being a Tyrantus. Playing it on turn 6 could easily shut out most control decks. But on the other hand, minions like Crypt Lord, Mind Control Technician, and Tark Reaper protected it against aggro decks. Around the same time, Taunt Druid popped up with the introduction of Witching Hour. However, it only saw moderate success in mid-tier 2 since it couldn't beat Q-Block very consistently. Drawing Oakheart won you games on the spot, whereas drawing big minions clogged up your hand. For the same reasons, the deck couldn't even run two ultimate infestations. This meta remained for two months until Spiteful Summoner, Q-Block, Crystal Core, and Cult Arms were all nerfed. Understandably, this shifted the meta completely. Witchwood, even after rotation, didn't impact the meta well enough, so these nerfs managed to have the intended effect. This also led to a new era of Druid dominance. Out of nowhere and within two weeks, Token Druid and Malagos Druid came out. Token Druid felt like the old school combo Druid with a powerful ramp shell. Whispering Woods and Soul of the Forest made it difficult for the opponent to clear the board, enabling you to cast multiple Savage Roars and Branchings the turn after. This deck especially excelled at beating board-centric archetypes. Malagos Druid, on the other hand, used the ramp shell to go on a different combo route. With the help of Twig of the World Tree, you could summon up to three Malagoses, Malagai, and burst your opponent down with Moonfires and Swipes. However, as this deck was reliant on Twig for the full combo damage, it was very susceptible to weapon removal. It didn't matter though since the deck didn't have to rely on the combo to win the game. The Druid Shell allowed it to work double duty as a tempo deck if need be. Sometimes it could win by summoning two Lich Kings early in the game. Ramping was just that consistent. To try and fight Malagos and Token Druid, Taunt Druid made a resurgence. With Dragon Hatchers and Sleepy Dragons, Taunt Druid was an utter menace to the other Druid decks. To beat a powerful ramp deck, you need a more powerful ramp deck, and once the Resurrect chain started with Carnivorous Cube on Hadronox, the other Druid had no chance to win. Taunt Druid didn't even need weapon removal to beat Malagos Druid as it had enough armor gain to be out of reach of the full combo. Together, all three of these decks took up the tier 1 slots. With this, you would think that the next expansion, Boomsday Project, would bring Druid down a notch, but to everyone's surprise, it actually pushed it even higher. Giggling Inventor and Flabidinous Floop made their debut. Malagos Druid didn't have to rely on Twig anymore to deal Burst. It could do significant damage by playing Malagos on one turn and playing Floop the turn after. 
Dream Petal Florist was also added at this time. If Dream Petal managed to reduce the cost of Malagos, then the combo could kill the opponent with just 10 mana. Meanwhile, Token Druid with Boomsday had become more of a taunt Token Druid. However, these were cheap taunts like Serenite Chain Gangs and Giggling Inventors. With the help of Strong Shell Scavengers and Taunt Minions, Token Druid could put up early game pressure like never before. And Floop's interaction with Chain Gang and Strong Shell made it a terrifying addition to the deck. However, these Druid decks weren't the only archetypes to dominate the latter. Dream Petal allowed another Druid deck to flourish, Togwaggle Druid. This deck revolved around the idea of drawing your whole deck and then swapping decks with your opponent, then copying their hand with Azalina so you also get a copy of King's Ransom, meaning that you get to keep the stolen deck. So why did people play the Malagos combo when Togwaggle causes infinite fatigue? Well, Togwaggle Druid filled a different role. Malagos Druid was better at beating decks like Deathrattle Hunter and Shutterwalk Shaman, whereas Togwaggle Druid was better at beating aggro decks, Odd Warrior, and incidentally, Malagos Druid. In the end, the choice of the deck depended on what kind of decks you wanted to beat. People even experimented combining the different archetypes, trying to combine Malagos and Togwaggle, and Togwaggle and Token. Those decks were just as good since they all shared the same powerful Druid shell. This was truly the golden age of Druid. But it was still ripe for innovation. Mechathune Druid was another archetype that emerged from Boomsday. Relying on drawing the whole deck like Togwaggle Druid, but being forced to play every single card before it could do the Mechathune, Innervate, and Naturalize combo to win the game. Having to save a naturalize and playing every card made the deck a bit worse than Togwaggle Druid, so it didn't see much play. Similarly, Taunt Druid received no new cards to help it beat the now very Malagos Druid-centric meta, and so it fell to Tier 3 alongside Mechathune Druid. On October 18th, Giggling Inventor was nerfed to 7 mana. Old Druid decks that had it removed it from their lists, but their archetypes stayed at Tier 1 regardless. Druid remained the same leading up to the release of Rastakhan's Rumble in December. However, this expansion was similarly pretty underwhelming. No shift in the meta was made. But three weeks in... T'was the night before Christmas, and all through the ranks, standard players were cheering, giving Blizzard their thanks. No more would Malfurion cast Wild Growth on two, and Nourish was nerfed, killing Druid through and through. The nerf of Wild Growth and Nourish marked the end to the Golden Age of Druid. Being classic set cards, these changes affect Druid for the rest of time. In fact, people were not sure if Druid was even a viable class anymore. And while that may have been true for Ladder, it was not true for the competitive scene. A new type of Druid emerged which utilized the card, Hakkar the Soul Flayer. This new deck did not care about ramping, at least not in the traditional sense. The idea was to draw your entire deck and swapping with the help of Togwaggle yet again. However, instead of keeping the stolen cards, we now give our opponents a Corrupted Blood deck. With the help of two Naturalizes and giving your opponent two Corrupted Bloods, we can deal over 100 damage. The deck required a lot of calculations and the right lineup to do well, so it never made a splash on ladder. As of today, Druid decks exist in the middle of Tier 2. However, the overall power level of most decks, with the exception of Hunter and Priest, have been reduced. With the Year of the Dragon approaching, Druid's fate remains unknown. This new rotation causes every Druid deck to lose many of its crucial cards. And with the nerf to its ramp cards, Druid now feels like it's missing its class identity. Even though the power level of all classes has gone down and will continue to do so after the loss of Death Knights and Gen and Baku, Druids are known for shapeshifting and adapting. So here's to hoping Druid makes a comeback in the Year of the Dragon in whatever form that may be. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.